Hello dear Trappist, this is Lick. If you're listening to this on the day of its release, Welcome May the 9th, 2024, this is the day of Trap Live. So we can't put out an episode today. Trap Live is being recorded and will come out in two weeks' time, but today's episode is really just a placeholder. Just to give you something to get your ears into and tide you over for the next two weeks. This episode is, you know, we put it together at virtually no expense. It's a compendium of some of the best bits of Trap since the inception. So I hope you enjoy it. Now Speak with you on the other side, assuming we don't kill each other at Trap Live. Live. I think when I get to 60, I'm going to keep on doing what I do because I love it. And I love that, like Carl, I love the meetings. It's the best part of the job and the interacting with people. Uh, and I get a lot of personal worth from, from, from doing my job. What am I going to do? You know, I'll be looking at the, are the pubs open yet? You know, and that, and I, that, that's, that, that, I, I don't want don't to fall more into that kind of lifestyle for sure. So, what I'm saying is I'll probably work and work and work until one day I just think, you know, what, I just don't enjoy it. The regulatory burdens are too much. And at that point, I'll either sell my business or I'll just give it to somebody. I, you know, I've always said that in our financial plan, myself and pennies, there is no sell value on the business. If we get something, it's an absolute burn. Who knows what legislation is coming down the train, the train tracks in 10, 15 years time that could wipe out all of our businesses. You know, it may well be the FCA says, listen, going forward now, we don't want these one man or small micro businesses. You've got to have X million of, of cap ad you've got to have at least 30 advisors and you're going to follow a prescribed path to deliver financial advice it might sound a bit wacky but you never know what's coming down the line and that would wipe out all of our businesses so i haven't built in any business plan a uh, business sale in, in our financial plans i will just sell the business and i'll just do it cold turkey i won't hand over andy to someone um like a young apprentice i mean maybe my son will develop into a financial advisor i don't know um but I'm, I'm not forcing that on him by any means and i'm certainly not letting him know it's an option because i want him to go and forge his own path in the world and not uh I, I think we've all known ifa firms where it goes from and yes it, yes sorry ladies it is mayor when it goes from father to son and the son is an entitled twat and they're, they're, they're just generally useless and it doesn't end up well that, that's the, that's a latin phrase carl um so that's my that's my view on it as as, as the ultimate one i'm i'm, I'm more of a one-man band than ultra um and that's saying something that that, that and that's my approach to it. Uh, I'll keep on doing it for as long as I love it. At the moment I don't love it and we've got enough, I'll walk away. Andy. Just a quick chip in there. Um, the advisors I know that are solo founders that have then employed an advisor to basically take over all the client work, they're not taking on a young apprentice. It's a very established advisor and they're paying them a serious chunk of money because the company mm. can afford it. Um, you know, they're hitting the ground sprinting. They're not hitting the ground walking, running. They're hitting the ground sprinting. And it's usually an advisor they've known for 10, 20 years anyway. And that advisor, for various reasons, have got has got capacity to basically look after the clients for X amount of years. So that's the quick point on that. And so what is the... Are you, are, you, are you angling? Are you angling there uh, to take over hat tip financial <laughs> services? Yeah, well, you, it's you, not it's, it might be a Nick's business plan, but I can tell you it's in undies. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a big spike in my voyant plan. Nick, Nick, <laughs> Nick losing uh, my so it, would be, it would be to a like-minded advisor like, like Andy, obviously, because we're, we're of a similar outlook and we, 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 we see the world in similar ways and we use the same kind of language with our clients and you want a, you want a c- consistency and con- continuity of message, don't you? So with Andy, with, if, with your approach and if you did that, if you, if you brought in an experienced advisor, right, you would still be owning Maven, but, but you'd just be paying this guy to, to, or girl yeah you to, are the 100 percent owner of the business you are 100 percent entitled to the profits or however you want to distribute everything the numbers need to be all right give me a call i've changed my mind give me a call andy after this well, that's great i'll do it whatever <laughs> two two pints and a pie yeah. and we'll, we'll it's sealed yeah but does this but does, it? Does, does, does this person then do all the client meeting do, do absolutely everything yeah so what i've seen what i've seen is keep it simple one solo advisor founder with a team of three admin uh, you know, looking after punchy numbers in clients, so high high profit in the company, minimal costs. You know, the 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 you know the the ultimate type firm of, of that setup, and then they don't want to sell to X Y Z grubby PLC. Um, however, they want the clients to be looked after and still you know juice the income out of that business that they've built for the last twenty or thirty years. So they find an advisor that they know well enough that's still quite young, let's say late 40s, early 50s. You pay them a couple hundred grand Very a year up. to do all the client work. You're still regulated um, as the owner for various reasons because you're still discussing things with people and, you, and, you, and, you, and you're a rainmaker. Um, so you bring in new clients for the person um, below okay. them. So you're giving up, I don't know, let's say 20 to 30% of what you used to take out the company will be now diverted to the 
to the salary of this advisor that's going to hit the ground sprinting and take over the clients. Again, similar type of uh, advisor that is, you know, financial planning led, you know, global yeah, equity, asset values, allocation, kind of investing. Stuff, yeah. You know, it's not like, oh, uh, we're going to pull out the plumbing of uh, Mr. and Mrs. Miggins that you've been looking after the last 20 years and we're going to set up a, mm-hmm. an offshore multi-trust situation. It's like, no, 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 no. Just, just keep all the plumbing the same. It's perfectly set up, my friend. Don't don't bollocks it up. So yeah, that, that, that's the strategy I've seen and I think that is uh, going to become more and more common potentially. It's interesting because we don't, we don't take much of an onboarding fee, an upfront initial cost. Sometimes we take we take zero, and sometimes it's relatively small. The cool default time. model is three percent. That's it. You take three percent of assets. I can't so, believe. I just so, cannot so believe. There is a, there's a huge incentive to onboard clients and take three percent of their wealth as an initial and provide no service fee, and then that that's it. And um, again, the Shocking. SJP thing was all about incentives, and people were getting rewarded, and people were you know having you know, big celebration days and things like that for, and it was just, it's as somebody referred to it and, and there's lots of big organizations like this It's institutional asset gathering where all the incentives are onboarding assets. And then, and then you just want to keep them on board and we're doing as little as possible. So commercially you want to do as little as possible because there's more profit in doing that. But legally you're expected to do something. Nick. It's funny, but it's because I mean, our business models here I, I yeah like you like I don't charge for the initial financial plan. I don't charge for the onboarding because the value to being blunt, the value to me is in the ongoing yeah. relationship with the client for which they are paying me for which I provide an ongoing service. So that's the bit that I absolutely focus on. It's it's completely inverted to yeah. the asset gathering yeah, kind of model. Yeah. Well, that's why Nick, that scaling a financial planning firm is bloody hard. Yeah, yeah. that's why we have to hire more <clears throat> staff because we've committed to proper, real, full financial planning. So you got to deliver the service. So yeah. like these, the SJPs of this world who are trying to reinvent themselves to offer this, it ain't going to be easy. It is not going to be easy. Well, it no, is the it's not. It's going to be hit hugely as a result. Because bottom line, you need, you need e- more time, more people, just m- more resources to deliver this stuff. Yeah, lots of expertise yeah. as yeah. well. It's so not, I mean, it's not just it's about, be, yeah. It must have been a gravy train for some of these companies. If you can onboard clients and take half percent or one percent a year of their generally oh. growing assets – and send out an annual valuation statement or something, whatever no, was being that, done. Probably. Or not, or not as we'll that. talk about oh. in a second. Just, yeah. just send out not. login okay. details. Yeah. This is a version of extrapolation, isn't it? We assume something's just happened or something's recently exactly. happened. Exactly. It's always going to happen. It's going to get cons- cons- you know worse or better or whatever. It works the other way as well. The danger of straight line cash flow forecasting is we assume it's always going to be, or potentially could be, could be good. If you have, if you run a cash flow model and it looks, you're absolutely fine for the rest of your life, it might not be the case. So there are no guarantees here. The other thing that's never factored in is the rate you, you mentioned one, Nick, which is job security, for example, but there's a whole lot of other variables that are never factored in. So you've got health. Health is one. This is assuming you're always going to be healthy enough to work or create an income or whatever. Um, there is political things, tax rates. You assume something's going to happen and the tax rate doubles. Well, again, outside of your control. Um, God forbid, what if you got divorced? All of a sudden, all your things on track, you've suddenly you know, walked away from, <laughs> you, you put it this way, your personal finance, your wealth is significantly different to what it was before. So there are multiple just life associated variables of which there are no guarantees. And this just demand or expectation for, absolute guarantee and a 4% withdrawal rate will keep you safe and all that wrong. So your point is well made, Nick. It's about being grown up. It's about being, you know, essentially human, having the kind of right brain skills to advise, consult, really go deep with your clients, what's important to them. And it's just, it's a, it's a, it's it's a compass. It's not a specific, it's not a map. It's not just telling you exactly where you must go. It's just telling you the broad direction of where, where you are today and where you need to be one, three, five, ten years from now. That's all this can be. So I completely agree with you. All the academics that are demanding precise science behind it, uh, it, it, it's not true. As we know, you know, good quality outcomes are more of a human and a personal sort of issue than they are a scientific or a maths one. That's my thoughts. What do you think, Mr. Widger from Ireland? Yeah, I think um, I think Nick kind of hit the nail on the head there when he said, you know, it's it's when you're planning for people who are somewhere between fifty and seventy, you're doing a fifty-year plan, 
Now, if you're doing a 50-year plan for someone, there's only one thing absolutely sure is that that plan is wrong. Because mm. you, you just, there are, we've, you, you just said it, Alan, there are too many variables. So I, I think the point is that people, however, do like to have some semblance of a plan. And I think that's why financial planning and being real financial planners, um, it's so important that we impress on every single person that comes through our doors that it's a process. It's yeah. not a one-off. So you can have a beautiful document saying, here's your financial plan and good luck and good night. And we think you should go into X, Y, and Z. Well, that's what the private banks do, right? That's not what real financial planners do. They map out um, a, a, a rough plan over a long period of time. But where you can get specific is the first few years of the plan. So on the one hand, we're trying to say, trying to encourage people to look to the long term or whatever. But then on the other hand, as financial planners, we can look to, well, how much money are we going to need to spend over the next couple of years? And we don't have that money in the market. So we do have that money available. And, you know, it's, it's, it's so, so important that you stress that to the clients. And I think, you know, we've all been through it over many, many years now with, with, with certain clients. And, uh, you know, the, 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 yeah, the, 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 best, the best meetings for me in terms of financial planning are when the clients are standing up and they're, they're looking at their, their plan and they're saying, and what have we put this in here and what have we put that in there? So they get engaged in the plan, but, but they understand the short-term you know, focus but also the long-term focus. And I, I, I think, um, you know, to, to summarize Alan's point, it's the, the famous Mitch Anthony phrase, you know, when life goes in transition, money moves. And you don't know what that transition might look like. And it can be good, it can be bad, and it can be bloody ugly. Um, so, you know, we're, we're trying to give, you know, guidance over a long period of time, but that's all we're trying to give. And trying to be precise or... I agree with you, Nick, this um, guardrails and all that stuff. They're, they're just useless financial products that are not required, in my opinion. Carl Widger, once again, showing the wisdom of the Irish. Amazing. When people haven't gone on the quest to find a financial advisor, they think financial advisors are desperate to take them on. So they'll yeah. call up one person and be a little bit rude and be like, well, I've got this. Are you going to come and see? It? And, and, and the advisor might be like, mm, we don't really do that. And they think, oh, my God, I got pushed back there. And then the next yeah. person they call, they're a lot more, oh, um, I'm looking for a financial advisor. Is there any chance you can have? You know, they're a lot more sort of cordial to, to the process. And they might have got pushed back from about three or four financial advisors. And then they'll ring up the fifth one and they'll go, what have I got to do to get a financial advisor? Like I thought this would be easy and you, you guys and girls will be clamoring to my door to sign me up. And we're all sort of screening them going, no, I don't want you from a sort of personality point of view. I don't want you from a wealth point of view. <laughs> it's because there's we, not many we financial describe, advisors. We describe our, that initial conversation um, with a prospective client. And we say the purpose of that is just to identify if you're a good fit for us, if we're a good fit for you. Because yeah. sometimes we yeah. meet people that aren't a great fit for us but we, we you know we, we'd happily send you to somewhere else or where you, you might be a better fit and all of a sudden the dynamics change you're right they go hang on yeah, a minute. I, yeah, thought every, yeah. I thought every advisor wants my business well maybe maybe not and that's that's the thing once you've been in business for a while and you've got a mature business I, you definitely you're definitely not I have, you, you, I are, you I are considering i haven't gone full steam ahead with it but i think some people call them client interviews yeah. um you know like a discovery meeting um, you know, we'll have an interview to see if you're a fit for us. And immediately the framing of that is, is Jesus Christ. I didn't realize you were interviewing me. I mean, it's the whole Nick Murray thing, isn't it? We're qualifying them. They're not qualifying us. Um, I, I yeah, heard on, on one of your, on, on your latest podcast, Andy, um, the guy, the, the personal trainer guy that you interviewed was really yep. good. And he does personal repellent mar yep. marketing on his website. So he's kind of pre-screening people saying, if you're not X, Y, and Z, basically don't contact me. We're not going to get um, on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I thought it was, um, you know, maybe not quite as harsh as, as how he puts it, but, you know, your, your, your marketing messaging can help in terms of screening people before they even come to you for that first meeting. Um, okay. So I yeah, think, I think uh, you know, to, to, to focus in on that would be, would be a good idea for everybody. Tell okay. people in all we're of your messaging. That, we, Carl, yeah. we're giving that a good, Sorry, uh, we're giving that a good, We've given that a good going over. Um, I'm going to draw a line under it because we're, we're t Tempest is fugiting as we speak. Um, so you mentioned that the vetting process, that that, that 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 discovery meetings, the client thinks they're interviewing you, you're interviewing them, and that is a Nick Murrayism. And on that note, Nick Murray had his um, annual behavioural conference last week, 
Uh, he used to do it in, in Manhattan. Um, and he's certainly been, I think, Alan, you might have been. I can't remember. Uh, I, I never had the chance to go. He's not doing the physical meetings anymore. It's all online. I, I, I uh, um, attended that online thing last week. And it was, you know, I know some of us are a little, we raise our, I can feel people in the, in, in the trap uh, studio raising their eyebrows at Nick Murray a little bit. Yes, he does say the same thing pretty much every year. He finds year new ways to year. say it and he invents new words to say it that go on Andy's new word list that he's he's building up in the background. <laughs> True but, story. But, you know, he talks about get, dispensing the vitamin C to clients all the time. And when I listen to Nick Murray, he, he's dispensing the vitamin C for me. You know, it's just, oh, yeah, you know what? He is right. And that's a nice turn of phrase. And these stats do add up. Um, it was very good. The best part, he, he does three sessions and then a and a session at the end, which is like overcoming objections. He, although he wouldn't call it that. He'd, he'd slap me if I said overcoming objections. Um, and the, the Q&A bit is very, is very good. You know, how when, when somebody has an objection to or raises something, just ask what the real, just keep on ask the question, ask a question back and find out what the real issue is because people, prospects will ask a question, but that's not actually the question they're asking. They, they, they just... But there's something else going on, and you just you just got to peel the onion very slowly. So that was very good. Um, I don't have much more to say on that, except to say that on the back of the whole behavioural thing, which I think we you know we are all wedded into, right? That's our value proposition, really. Is is here's Mr. and Mrs. Client. Here's your plan. Here's the next thirty years of your life. We're going to keep you on this plan, right? We're going to stop you blowing yourself up, and we're going to save you tax and costs and expensive fees along the way. But we're going to stand between you and stupid. Now, so on my mavenadvisor.com website people go there and want to potentially become a client anyway so subscribe to my uh, email newsletter and the first question i ask them in bold is what's your biggest financial concern at the moment just hit hit reply just to see where they're at and i got a reply a couple of days ago from someone saying my biggest financial concern is to do with whether i should have bond bonds as part of my portfolio at all and then he goes on to list four points about bond funds i think i shared it with you the other guys this to me is obviously a red flag. This is not your biggest financial concern at the moment. It, I suppose it might be, but it's not the real concern. But yeah, when clients answer things like that, you got. But, but I think Andy, to be fair, he, he, that, that that client or, or prospect may well consider that to be his greatest financial concern at the moment. Yeah, and I suppose it, it's it's inherent on all of us if if real financial planning is what we're about is to is to br- bring those clients on the journey with us and to explain you know the real important you're, stuff you're, and, you're so right keep it simple carl I, I what i've learned over the years is to meet that client or that prospective client where they are i used to if i met someone like that say no 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 that is not your issue at all your issue is you know something else having enough money if, to last if, the rest of your if, life and you, that's not how you win people that's I not get how it, you engage with if, people if you, you say saw, i understand if you, if, tell me if, more about the bond if, issue tell me more if, about that and then you win you them s- across okay if you saw the rest of the four points that this person it's obviously a guy has listed my tacit knowledge tells me this client's going to be a nightmare but yeah i get it but you'll take him on anyway so i don't do i don't do seminars i don't i haven't organized a seminar for either my clients or or for other advisors really i i, I get involved with andy with the Vointist user group um, to, to an extent, and that's now a webinar. And that's really what, what I, 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 yes, I know, I, Carl, I can feel a part of you dying inside, and, and Alan, maybe you as well. If I was to do anything, I would now do it as a webinar, not a seminar. I, I think the days of, unless, you, you, you know, bigger firms, maybe you, you can do something, you do your golf days, I totally get it, fine. But I think for, for, the, for, the, for the lifestyle financial planner, webinars are the way forward. And um, Phil Bray, Who's a, who does listen to the show, runs the Arctic Agency, a well-known marketing brand in in, in fina- UK financial services. He's written two really good long forms on how to organize a, uh, a webinar, not a seminar, but a webinar. And I'll, I'll put links into them. And actually, it's, 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 it's an object lesson in content marketing from Phil, which you'd expect because he's a marketing expert, because he's given chapter on verse. The first piece is how to organize a webinar. Everything you need to do. So he mentions Eventbrite. He mentions LinkedIn. He mentions upgrading your Zoom package. Don't run it as a Zoom meeting. You have to buy the webinar package, which is about 600 quid a year. It just it just works way better if you do that. And then the second long form piece that he wrote is the 10 mistakes that you should avoid when doing a webinar, which is really the same article, but just rewritten. Uh, really good. And you read this thing. Crikey, he's, Phil here has given away everything I need to organize a webinar. 
but it's, it's subtle content marketing because I think a lot of people will look at this and think, Jesus Christ, there's a lot of moving parts here that can go wrong. I need to turn to an expert to organize this webinar for me. Who's the expert? He's just demonstrated his expertise. It's Phil Bray at the Arctic Agency who makes one oblique sales line in it and says, of course, if all this is too much for you, you might wish to outsource the organizing and running of your webinar to people that know what they're doing. So it's very subtle. So uh, I would I would look at that. I, I might... I'm just con- conjuring with the idea. I might run an annual webinar for my clients, which will just be to talk around the investment uh, fund running the portfolio. Maybe do it in January each year, looking back over the last year. But of course, as a one-man band, I would need to get a third party involved. The one, if you're doing webinars, don't do it by yourself because you've got enough going on with the presentation. You have to have someone looking at the chat, looking at the questions, doing the housekeeping and so forth. So I don't know if maybe Dimensional would step in and would give a 10-minute overview of where the markets have been over the last year or so. Um, and I know you're thinking, well, Nick, that's, that's, that's kind of counterintuitive to your core message, which is don't yeah. focus on the investments. But I just think once a year, just saying, well, you know, what's happened? Where what just 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 going through the portfolio, just going through the thirteen thousand great company. I don't know. I'm just throwing it out there. It's probably because I read this article and it's front of my mind on how to do a webinar, and I haven't done a webinar, and I want to do it. I, yeah, I'm just that's, yeah. That's I, I like that idea, Nick. And and look, the, there's no part of me uh, thinks that that it's not the way to go is to do webinars going forward. We're definitely looking at them. And throughout COVID, we did a number of webinars um, that I hosted, and we got actually loads of people on them. So I'm not against that idea at all i just i'm just a little bit old-fashioned in that i love pressing the flesh and i love just meeting people face to face so um you know but i do understand that there is another way and i'm I'm not convinced it's a better way but there's another way and of course we should be exploring all of the ways so yeah I, i i like that idea and i do like the annual seminar about investments i think that's a really great idea actually In 2015, our esteemed regulator, the FCA, published document, uh, Fair Treatment of Customers, which was distilled down as TCF, Treating Customers Fairly. First published 12th of May 2015. Have it in front of me. Obviously, I I remember it um, very well. But going through, there are six consumer outcomes. And without reading them all out, but outcome six, and I quote, Consumers do not face unreasonable post-sale barriers imposed by firms to change product, sw- switch provider, submit a claim, or make a complaint. I think you the tell key me word there was point, unreasonable, Alan. I think the key word there to be interpreted, I'm, I'm not saying for or against, that word unreasonable is just well, it's, it's, a it's lawyer's dream. Interpretation. It's a lawyer's it, dream. Yeah. Right. So I, and I just think in my business, I'm looking at you guys as well. If I took on a client and either million pounds in a pension product and we did all the work for him we set him all up and he just and he came back to me 11 months later and said my circumstances have changed or something else has happened i need to move that fund elsewhere i say absolutely fine here's my invoice sixty thousand pounds please pay the invoice and i'll make sure the paperwork is done i think i'll be having a battle for that particular i think that client would interpret that as being unreasonable unreasonable i, ju- I just i just do and the other thing uh, i would say is for for the largest wealth management company, as you say, Andy, with 200 billion of assets under management, the weight of evidence in favor of index investing and not employing active fund pickers, stock pickers, the weight of evidence is overwhelming now. It's it's not even up for dispute, peer-reviewed academic papers year after year after year. As far as I'm aware, there is not one single index passive type fund that you can get access to. Through that organization. Just, uh, maybe some others can answer that. The other thing that people obviously say about them is their their high costs. So their annual management charge all in. I think the lowest it can be is about 1.6. I could be wrong on that. And the highest it can be is about 2.3. But again, there might be other fees I'm not too aware of. It just shows you the real cost to run a long-term scalable business that employs all the right people in all the right places. I believe they're a high-end vanilla firm. They don't get involved in too many weird and wacky type financial products. I mean, yes, they are quite involved. I believed in, I believe in EIS and VCT and a couple of other sort of inheritance tax type product stuff. But you don't often hear about huge blow-ups within the company, so they're they're, they're quite tight on their on their risk. So, as I say, it is said that they are quite expensive on an ongoing basis. But is that is that 
the cost to run a business that can be scalable for this long. Many have tried to do it cheap and it's not worked out. Uh, Nick and then Carl. Yeah, thank you. Um, so my views on SGP, it is an interesting one. I uh, Yeah, business-wise, absolutely superb. Brilliant. And it just shows that some people want to pay a bit more and they're quite happy to do it. It's the stellar Artois thing. We, we seem to be consumed with getting down to the lowest basis point, shaving a basis point. Some people don't want that. Some people don't want low touch, low cost. Some people want high touch and higher cost. And that's exactly what SJP gives gives them. Some people want want a seminar at the local country pile on inheritance tax and come along for some food and wine. They want that. They want the, the massively thick business card. They want the valuations on beautiful cartridge paper. Some people want that. No, no, all, all, uh, this is the point. Just you guys won't admit to it, right? We (laughs) are not trying to reinvent the wheel. None of us on this podcast have come up with any original ideas. We've just seen some stuff that has worked really, really well. And we're just, we're just putting our own twist on it. And, And we have. So like, if you come, if you tell me that, oh, well, I thought of this idea. You didn't, because I can guarantee I'll find someone who came up with with the idea first, right? Who's done it already. We're just, can you put them into a complete package and, and, and and make it, you know, something that's a really great experience. And look, there's lots of things that, that, and and, and I'm very interested to hear Alan's, right? Because he's obviously put some thought into this, right? But um, I saw a post from um, Stephanie Bogan on LinkedIn only last week and it was relevant to this, right? And it was like, how can you make your client meetings like a Michelin star experience? And I'll put the link in the, in the show notes to that as well. And that's what you're after. And it's, it's like every touch point, how can you make it, you know, five, six, seven star experience. And, and that's what you should always be trying to do. And, and, you know, I'm always challenging the guys here. How can we make it better? How can we make it better? And when you th- think you have it nailed, then it's, you know, let's go and look for other ideas. You know, because I've been in this business a long time, I've seen them all. I remember when commission disclosure was brought. I, I was I was not an advisor then, but it was going to you know com- you had to actually tell your customers, your clients, how much you were earning. For yeah. a piece of advice. Yeah. It was just shocking. I mean, I when I was uh, working for a product provider, I used to speak to my IFAs, and they, they were all just freaking out about it. How could I possibly tell my customers <laughs> what I'm what are going to earn from it? And then you had, of course, the commission disclosure on, on quotations, which often would get uh, dropped off the, you know, mysteriously removed from the stapling in the back of the thing. No, um, no, I, 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 when I was a broker consultant, I used to deal with uh, at least one IFA who would just rip off the final page. Yeah. <laughs> It was okay, whatever, you know, whatever. If you can you said yourself. at least one, Nick. I thought you were going to say at least one didn't rip off the back page. <laughs> Not that but, but commission disclosure in 93 slash 94, because I just joined then as a callow mm. seven-year-old. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, it was like, now it's just like, it's so automatic, isn't it? It's just, you don't even, you know, it's, they, yeah, we... Well, but, in the old days, we got I, pay commission and no one, you know, people knew, knew but, but pre-1994... You didn't have to disclose it. It's just like, wow, different world. Different world. I, I, I think I think the two, two themes are we're just becoming more transparent and, and better qualified, which is great. They're two yep. big things that we're, we we're very keen on. But then it overcorrects, doesn't it? So then now, it you know, the disclosure and transparency is like the client's thinking, why do I need to, you know, like, I get it, Andy, we're in. Anyway, yeah, all good, long story. Yeah, stuff, uh, right? my, my, my final point well, on that is, is you know, th- there is – potentially good news in this right for for us who are already set up and in business is that it's a barrier to entry it's another barrier Massive. to entry yeah. so is that that the regulators surely don't want that that the, that advice you, gap you, we've spoken about before they, they don't, don't care how, about how the I, advice I, gap Carl. they don't care about the advice gap everything they then look at what people say <clears> look at what they do everything that they do broadens this so-called advice gap right yeah. but you know I, I think about this and, and there's all the um comparisons with sport for example and it's like football or rugby and knowing the offside rule or something like that. You can you can use it to your advantage. I've often thought about compliance and everyone I spoke to would say, oh, and they were just moaning, bloody regulators, bloody compliance. And I thought, if I can get a step ahead of it, if I can understand like the rules of the game and I can optimize it the way that we, then you're either, I agree with you, Carl, if it's making life difficult for everyone else and we've just going to spend a bit of time and attention to make it better or smoother, um, that's that's a competitive advantage. 
for us. And that's the way I treat these things. I, yeah, I huff and puff like everyone else does. But I think, right, you know, you either want to, you either play around, you know, understand the offside rule or don't play the game. That's the way I see this. I've got a final point on this. Uh, a very uh, old, wise financial advisor who I often moan to about this profession and all the things coming in. Uh, you're probably going to take the mick out of me for saying this, but he said um, the way you got to look at it, Andy, is isn't it amazing that thorns have roses? Isn't it terrible that roses have thorns? You know, it's the way you look at these things that will, you know, dictate how you deal with it. Um, and that's it. Yeah, stick to the magic mushrooms, my friend. Okay, um, <laughs> that does kind of that does kind of lead on to our next about? point. <laughs> When we do, um, say, cash flow plans, right, our, what, what are we always looking to do? We're trying to get rid of red out of the plan, right? So any cash flow shortfalls in the long term. And then when we talk about investments, we're always talking about in the long term. So you got to stick with the plan and you got to, you know, look to the long term. And if we're looking at returns and all that kind of stuff, it's long term, it's long term. Everything is long term. And um, I thought about this from my own point of view that, you know, do you know what? Um I've been doing a lot of, um, over the last few years, when this happens, I will do this or, you know, we will have that experience or I will feel this particular way. And do you know what, guys? I'm just tearing that plan up and I'm going to start living each day as it comes. I'm going to start living living in the moment. And I've had some experiences um, in the very recent past with clients whereby yeah of course we're always looking to are we going to run out of money and all of that kind of stuff so just just two quick stories i have a absolutely <laughs> wonderful couple who've been clients of ours for a good few years and unfortunately the husband passed away um last year so it's 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 about maybe nine months ago at this stage and i i left a gap before obviously there's some cleaning up we have to do in terms of investment portfolios and that kind of stuff and putting it into one name and it's it's all tough stuff. So I, I always try and leave a big gap. Uh, thankfully, this hasn't happened too often. But um, when I sent the email out to the spouse, she's absolutely diamond of a lady. And she just came back and went, yeah, look, it's been a tough, tough time. And we had so many plans for travel post COVID and they were, they were hanging on. And obviously those plans are out the window now. And I just felt so um, without sounding, I, I really, really hope this doesn't sound condescending at all, but I, I just felt so sad and so sorry for her because they didn't get to do all of the things that they wanted to do. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's, it, just, it just drove home the point that, look, you know, don't wait around to do that bucket list item. And, and look, we're in the, 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 the lucky position that most of the people we talk to are quite privileged so they do have the resources to do the stuff now. And, you know, it's so incumbent on us as, as real financial planners to make sure that people go and live their best lives. Like that effect, that is our job. Our job is to, you know, match the resources with getting people to live their best lives. And I had another um, uh, new, new clients, uh, sold their business, um, have a bunch of money uh, for the last three years in the bank. And they're now kind of coming to us because they're worried about the effects of inflation, as they should be, and uh, you know, as, as is right. So they they came in. We did the plan. They're never going to run out of money, and you know, they wanted to do things like put in new windows in the house and and put in solar plans that kind of. And I haven't been doing it because they were worried that they were going to run out of money. And I was like, okay, the financial plan was able to tell us, look, this is not going to be an issue. We can drive it on. Um, but more than that, that there was kind of you know. Could I get a new car? And that would, you know, we'd get some thrill out of that because we haven't had a new car in years. And we'd love to go and uh, visit our daughter who's who's living abroad. And, you know, we're worried, you know, can we go for more than a week or whatever? And and without any question or doubt, we can. And I just thought it'd be it'd be it'd be a good conversation. It's it's not it's kind of philosophical as opposed to anything to do with uh, investments or any technical stuff. But, you know we spoke about what is our what is our main role here it's about managing human behavior but that's not the right way to say it our role here is to be the the facilitator to help people live their very best lives and that's where i get my greatest thrill when we we i have another story which i won't go into but thank you um 
a client is going to, we're running our future U event and he, he, he told me a story about he, he went to New Zealand for seven weeks to visit his son and brought his daughter over um, to New Zealand because his daughter had had a baby as his son's wife had had a baby and the two cousins had never met each other and he was able to facilitate that. And he said to me straight out, as you all know, we call it the Metis Life Plan. He said, because the Metis Life Plan gave us confidence to go and do that. And I just, I, I, the hair stood up in the back of my neck. Brilliant. And, Absolutely you know, brilliant. We send in advance a couple of videos. Different. We, we explain our investment proposition. One of, our, one of my colleagues, Graham, he's, set, he's created several really good quality videos which explain you know three minutes five minutes seven minute versions because that's too it takes too much time to explain it in a meeting and people haven't got all this sort of cognitive ability to process you know index fund and factor-based investing so we just send a couple of things if they don't watch it they don't watch it we don't sort of not have the meeting if they don't we we name everything so all the things so this meeting is not called a strategy meeting which is generic it's called a blueprint so everyone knows if we if you're building a house you hire an architect and they, they design a blueprint. It doesn't tell you what color the tiles are in the bathroom, but it tells you how many bedrooms it has, whether you're south facing or north facing or whatever, which is what this, this is all about. We're not going into the granular detail. It's high level stuff. In terms of the actual work, we follow Nick Lincoln's approach in terms of we build the initial model based on the information that we've had. And then in real time, we'll adjust it. Is this right? Is this correct? And, there was a, and you do a number of what ifs, of course. That's where the magic is. What if you did retire five years early? What if you did give yeah. your kids additional money, et cetera? And I think that is so important. I've seen other people who kind of have a pre-packed presentation. Here it is, almost like a PDF. This is your, and that's just, that's just doesn't work. It's very interactive and also shows that it's up to them. You decide what life you want to live. You tell me, and we'll see if the numbers stack up. So it's a really live and interactive situation um the only other thing i'll say is on the basis that we, we really think through because if these meetings and they do they do generally last two hours we'll have it automatically one of the other members of the team other you're usually two people a lead advisor an advisor and an associate which another in in all money is a power planner so we've got two people in the room because it's quite difficult as someone else has said to manage the client the conversations the the, the tech if it's just one person doing it. So two, you know, an advisor and a co-pilot, it works really well. And after about an hour, what we know is people will either want a comfort break or they might want to top up with their coffee or something. So, so someone gently knocks on the door after 60 minutes, pre-planned in advance and says, we don't want to take, you want to take a break now or do you want another coffee? And people think this is slick. It looks good, well thought through and organized. It's, the, it's about filtering and having an onboarding process, you know, and, and, and if you, if you've, if you're very careful with the vetting of people you bring on board, you shouldn't have problems down the line, which will come onto in the meat and potatoes. But also you bring people on who fit your service proposition. This is what I do for all people all the time. And if you yeah. don't want this, you don't get on the boat. You don't come on, you're not, you're not part of the squad in the first place. So I, I, once again, you know, if, if you know what you stand for and what your service is about, offer that to people and they either take it or they leave it. Okay, but if they come on board wanting that service, they pay for that service. The latest client I've taken on actually tried to embark on this on his own and the numbers just got too big and he needed a lot of help. And since I've worked with him, I've added so much value. The first thing we did is work out the money flow. Where's the money flow and is it going into the right pots and is it doing the right thing? Andy, the old Trucrepidarian Andy, he knows about everything. Andy, can't be told anything. His name is Andrew Hart. Andrew Hart! So I suppose it, again, boils down to we help people answer expensive questions. <laughs> seamless. 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 Um, yeah, so it got to a point where he had expensive questions. He didn't want to make any mistakes, so hence he, he sought out a financial advisor. Alan mentioned it. It's this lean versus fat fire. So lean is, yes, I want to retire at 37, sell my car, eat very frug frugally. I, I, conveniently, they, they don't have children, you know, and they only want to have a burn rate of, I don't know, 2,200 pounds a month, and, you know, and they, they can get there relatively easily. Whereas fat fire is you know, I want to spend 10 grand a month. I still crunch all the numbers. I'll still be in global equities. I still want to retire early at, let's say, 46 and do something that I'm more passionate about. So it's not as if I'm going to retire at 46, you know, and sit there and do nothing. You know, I'm going to be driven and, you know, help more and more people for what I can do. So you can 
There's various ways to skin it, slice and dice it. Um, time of recording, we're heading towards the end of 2023. And I'm just sort of throwing it open in terms of what people think about what are the, what do you do for planning next year? So I have just booked three days away by myself in a little cottage on the beach where I've got time away from the office, away from home life, where I've got time to, this is not a story. I've got a story coming up. Grab yourself a drink, a very long drink. It's story time with Alan Smith. Once again, you were premature, Mr. Lincoln. If Once again. You don't tell me you've got a story coming up. How am I supposed to know? Just trust me. I've always got a story. Well, not always. I've got a, I've got a brief story coming up in, in a few minutes. But this is not a story. This is just a reflection. This is something um, those of us who are serious about our business lives, I, I think that next year will be an interesting year. I think it'll be challenging in many ways. I think the economy will be extremely challenging. There's, as we already know, there's a hell of a lot going on in our sector, in our industry. And I like to take time away because I've never given myself enough time to think, to reflect, and to plan, and to organize. And so I'm, as I say, I'm taking myself away for three days. I just booked an Airbnb, cottage on the beach, secret location. Can't tell you boys because you might come and crash it and try to take me out to the pub, which I'm not going to do. Us. You have told us. <laughs> we are going to crash it. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't told you the location. Yeah, you showed the exact you showed link. picture. <laughs> yes, no location, no. I specifically removed the link. Just give so you you're, little, go, uh, you're going on your own to reflect for three days. So you're going to talk to nobody for three days. Correct. God yeah. bless Kat when you get home. Yeah, <laughs> I am. <laughs> be a lot of talking. He needs to get out of the system. Oh, I'm thinking of going on a uh, silent retreat. No talking for seven <laughs> days. <Yeah. laughs> no I'd chance. like to do that. I'd you'll be, you'll be that. kicked out in the first three hours. <laughs> So we've got a question posted via Twitter from uh, James Marston, and he's on Twitter at James Marston 88. I'll read the question out, and then one of you maybe can, who, who, who picked up on this question can answer it. Does the recent collapse in bonds invalidate the whole risk profiling process? And given that bonds clearly have as much downside as stocks in certain scenarios, aren't we all better off being in 100% global equity ETF? So who posted that question in there? In the, in the, in the, in the, I, I did. I got... Um... I got the message from James uh, about that. He had just been asking me via sort of messages on Twitter. Um, he, and so James, as I understand it, is a relatively new advisor. And of course, he's been you know, given the Kool-Aid to drink. This is what you do here. You do a risk profiler questionnaire. And if a client says, I'm low volatility, then you give them a load of bonds in their investment. And he's obviously being somewhat disillusioned by having done that, found that he's encountered tons of volatility and said, you know, well, we know that long-term global equities are the place to be. And so why don't we just invest in that 100%? Which, um, you know, we all we want to have some controversy. We want to have some a, a, um, good quality debate on this. But I think it's something we all agree with. <laughs> well, I, th I think I think um, I think we do. I think outside of our circle and maybe the Spartans that we mix with, what we're about to say and what you just said is going to give a lot of advisors willies um, because they, just, they 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 love their asset allocation and they love their fixed interest exposure because of modern portfolio theory. Stuff that I think we over the last fifteen years we've we've realised that bonds are rubbish for for income. They don't they don't do anything for income, and now we're seeing we're actually seeing they don't do anything to dampen portfolio volatility. So you have to ask the, the question: What is the point of them? What is the point of attitude to risk questionnaires? I I, I think this is a this is the, this is the great reset for bonds. This is our chance to get rid of this cancer out of our clients' lives, and I, I feel quite strongly about this, as you'll find out when I when I. When I talk about it. Say what you think, this, mate. Say what you think. This is our say chance. This is our real, real is it, chance. Is it, is it fair to say that the, this current crisis is the first, it's the first time I can remember where you've had a, you know, a, 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 a significant correction bear market in equities and long dated bonds, particularly at the same time. I mean, the, the yeah, great, worse. great financial bonds crisis. Worse, worse. Yeah, I know. But so in, in 2007, eight, if you invested in long government bonds, you actually were, you were in positive territory. I think you're up to seven. Yeah, you did all right. Yeah, you were. You're right. In that period. So that was one where the so called, you know, the asset allocation thing, if you wanted to dampen volatility, that was, that was fine. You did get, um, you, you, you did achieve you, that. You, now right. you haven't had it. You, you're right, Alan. Um, certainly it's not happened in the last 25 years. Um, I don't know it well enough to even go back further than that, mm -hmm. but there might be a case of it's never, ever happened. Um, it has happened. So that's in why. 
1994, the global equities lost value in that year and the fixed income markets, global government bonds around the world fell in value. Okay, uh, so and I remember it because it's so years unusual. Ago. It's so, yeah. yeah, I know, it's, it's 20 28 years, years ago. ago. So, so you're, it, it, you're, about, you're, you're about 45 then, weren't you, Nick? In Earth years, I was 45. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but is, is that maybe the, the answer if you're being contentious or you're defending? you know, asset modeling and, and risk profiling. It, it is a once in a quarter of a century or more situation, and you can't mitigate for those things in relatively normal market times. I mean, relatively normal is a global financial crisis, 2008. They held up well. I can't remember what happened in, in COVID times. I think bonds must have held up pretty well as well when the markets collapsed, well, the this, equity, when the equity markets collapsed. So generally speaking, they do. And this is, this is, you have to be clear as well about the particular type of bonds, because I know in 2007, people were investing in corporate bonds, which collapsed as far and fast as equities did. But, you know, government sovereign debt with like countries like UK, US and so on, tend to be a safe haven asset. So they okay, tend to the, be very... There are two points here. There are, there, there, I, I, I hear what you're saying, but we've, we've had bonds in portfolios as this, as this dampener. But, but we, why? Because there's, it's this, there's this slag, there's this dragon that we're slaying that doesn't exist. You know, we, you, earlier on, Alan, you mentioned that we're, we're looking at 30-year plans, multi-generational plans, plans that will span decades. It's impossible to lose money historically over any rolling 20-year period in the MS, MSCI World Index. You cannot lose money. Of course, so why, of so course. What role but, but what, what, this, is, this is a sop to, it's a sop. Hu, the, to, to, to human behavioral psychology because we know there are certain people that say, if my investments fall, I know, Nick, I'm investing for 20 or 30 years, but if I wake up one day and my 100,000 pounds is worth 80,000 or my million is worth 800, I'm going to be, I won't be able to sleep at night. That, all that. Sort of so that's why, and yes, it's an education process, but I think as we've all identified, you can have these conversations with the clients. The, the, one of the biggest failings in my mind for risk profiling is it asks you a question at a time when you're in a, in a place of, you know, if you like calm, calm discussions, you know, what would you, how would you feel if such and such, such and such? So what, but what always happens when you have significant market volatility, there's loads of other things going on in the world. Like, so COVID was, you might bloody die and your family might die. So you're not really work. And right now your mortgage rate's going through the roof. You might lose your job. Your family might lose their, their, so there's a lot of other things which makes risk profiling in itself um, qu questionable. The, the, I, I've talked in the past, if I said to either of any of you, are you, are you scared of snakes? You might say, mm, not really. If I literally throw a live snake on your lap, I trust me, you're going to, you're going to recoil. You're going to stand up or do something. But you told me you're not scared of them. So risk profilings are somewhat artificial in the way that they are presented and the time they're presented because you don't know how you're going to feel because there's probably a lot of other things going on. I think people should try and acquire new skills that would then lead to goals. When people set goals, they're just, they're, they're, they're quite loose. So I'm a fan of learning new skills anyway so a skill i learned last year was powerpoint it sounds a bit lame but um, oh. i needed to up my skills on it uh, anyway so that's that that's what what I'm, I'm basically just trying to say don't set goals learn new skills so if this year you've got a lot of stuff to achieve rather than saying i'm going to do x by then or y by then just learn new skills like it's called your you know your skill stack as uh, scott adams talks about intentional working and living for me. So I, um, I've i been down the burnout road before, right? And you'd imagine, well, if you've been down there once, you wouldn't let it happen again. I nearly let it happen again this year. Um, I spent Christmas nursing a bit of a cold. And the reason I'm standing today is because I popped a disc in my back. So for me, that's my body going, dude, sort something out here because otherwise you're on a, a slow road to nowhere. So for me, it's to... Be really intentional about looking after myself so that, you know, my job here at Meta is, is we have a really good thing going. So if I can be the best type of, you know, leader um, to be a visionary, to, to, to inspire people, well, then that's, that's where I'm going to have the most impact. And that's where this team needs me most. Your, your point there, Carl, about um, sort of looking after yourself <clears throat> is really well made. In the, and again, we've talked about this in the past. Um, I might mention it to you. Uh, there's, a, there's a book called Essentialism, Greg McEwen, mm. and there's a chapter in that. There's a whole section. You can look at it. It's on specific blogs on it. It's called Protect the Asset. 
And the, po- the point yeah. being, you can, uh, you know, people in, in your circumstances, you look after everyone else around them and trying to keep the team going and support the team and the family and everything else. But you're the big domino. If you go down, if you're getting stressed or you sort of can't show up, then there's so many other negatives that happen as a result of that. So it's so important to protect the asset. And the number one asset is, is you. And it sounds selfish, as you say, but it's absolutely not. It'd be selfish not to do that is the point. But check out Greg McEwen's writings. Ultra. I think all of us in this call have read enough books to know what we need to be doing in terms of looking after ourselves. But yeah, um, implementing monk mode a lot more in 2024 is going to be something that, yeah, I'm also going to be doing uh, as much as I can. Um, but it's hard. But, you know, we can read all the books, we can listen to all the podcasts, we can watch all the YouTube videos, but we need to wake up every day and put in the right behaviors. Um, and we yeah. know what the triggers and dominoes are for ourselves. Um, yeah, so let's try and keep each other all accountable. Um, yeah, anyway, that's it. Okay, well, I, okay, so it's round to me, I think, with my one uh, goal for 2024. And it kind of just tie in, ties in right, with no more, No more of that drop, Nick. We've had enough of that drop. So there's two more to go, mate, and I might do it all three when you're talking. Um, my one ties in with voices sort of health and, and, and well-being. Mine's to be more stoic and not to get maybe so caught up in what happens. Um, you know, Marcus Aurelius said, and then Shakespeare quoted it as well, but it's not what life, it's not what happens to you in life. It's how you choose, how you choose. That's the important word there, how you choose to react to events. So I'm just going to try and disassociate myself from what happens to me um, and focus more on actually ha- ha- how you react to it. So I think just just from a, um, just from being a more, a more loving, reasonable rounded lick Lincoln. that's my goal for 2024 set yourself up for failure there buddy yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right smithy simplify in in a word yep that's great my antipathy to bonds was existed before the meltdown in the bond market last year. It just happened to coincide nicely with it that my message was more resonant. But I just think you want to be an owner of the companies. You don't want to be a lender. You want to own a future income stream. You don't want to lend. Um, rising income. There's that. Rising I would also income. The, the, and just as, and and in case we come across as holier than thou, and perhaps I do sometimes. I, I have made every investment mistake under the under the sun to. To, to get where I am today. So when people sit down with me with their with their little pots of money and they're they're sort of they're they're, they're figuratively holding me by the hand and saying, Nick, don't screw this up because this is all we've got. What I bring to the table is over 20 years of knowledge of knowing how not to do things. It's it's the stuff you don't do with your money that will determine successful outcomes more than what you will do with it. Yeah. So it's avoiding all the all, all the crud. Um and having learned all these and having sort of got this thick skin from the mistakes, having got the calluses on my hand from all the mistakes I made at the cold face, that's given me this anchor that I can drop into the ocean. So when the waves come, I'm not buffeted from this way to that way. And this is, you know, we, we all believe in, in, in the great companies of the world. There'll be times when the great companies of the world are just absolutely temporarily going through the floor and these waves will be coming over you the pressure from clients, the media, and we just have this anchor that's in the sea just keeping us there because we have a belief system and we don't let it get rocked by our peers or whatever the new shiny object is on, on the street. It's a decision we all have to make. There's sort of key forks in the road. You need to do your exams. You need to understand how to do the job correctly. You need to earn money. You need to balance that with do you have kids and family. You know, it is challenging. And as I said, I earned sweet FA for my first 24 months. But luckily, I had a little bit of money saved. I didn't have kids. Mortgage rates were low. You know, I got lucky. Um, But yeah, uh, I took a lot of pain for short term. But long term, it's potentially pulling off so who's next you didn't mention the best day of your professional life the day you met me for a coffee and everything changed <laughs> what, the, 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 the day i went for a coffee with the multi-millionaire absolutely Alan shambles but then i ended up buying the coffee yeah that's it never let me forget the key word well a key word you mentioned there Andy, was the role that luck plays mm. in in our lives in every aspect not just our business lives but our personal lives and life in general certainly in business luck is you can't you can't invent luck you know it just happens to you but when it does happen to you you've got to be you've got to have the now to be able to seize it and i think carl you've got some thoughts thoughts around this yeah it's funny uh, before 
Andy and Alan joined myself and Nick were just chatting about this this morning before we went on air. And th- that's exactly what I said. I said, you know, we, we got to admit here that luck plays a massive part in it. And I, I think, you know, that was definitely a massive part of, you know, h- how I've ended up where I am. First of all, I went, I left a brokerage in 2010, set up on my own because I had to, and I wouldn't have if I didn't have, if I didn't have to, to be perfectly honest. I then did my own thing for, for three or four years. About halfway through that, I was product selling, as I said before. I went, okay, this is, I, I'm not adding any value here. I'm not getting any job satisfaction. There must be a better way. So I went researching myself. At the time, Friends First, who no longer exist here, they've been bought out by Aviva, ran a course about financial planning. I went on that course and met uh, Carl Daly, who I set up Metas with originally in 2014. Um, and I kind of just took it from there and went, okay, let's research this as best as we possibly can. I do believe people at that crossroads now are luckier because they do have, um, well, they've trapped, but they've DFA. They, they have loads of different resources they can go to, loads of different people who are willing to kind of help, loads of um, people who are doing real financial planning and it wasn't a thing in Ireland at all. Um, And I guess it was, you know, when Andy was, when you were working with Tina, it was kind of, it was in its infancy. So, you know, you are in a better place because there's lots more people to learn from, but exactly like Andy said, um, we struggled uh, really badly from 14 to 16. I've often told this story where struggled to pay staff, um, the directors didn't get paid for a number of months in the first 24 months. Um, but it was almost like a light switch. Once it started to happen, then we started growing exponentially. But it did take two years. Now, looking back, right, um, I think that's because we were um, poor at telling the story about what financial planning is, the benefits of financial planning. And I suppose we were in a marketplace where this was all entirely new. Um so, you know, if you're in a place whereby you're in a firm that's a, in Verticom is a bad firm and you want to go and do it, I think you're, I think, you know, you're lucky in that you're in an environment where you can go and do it. Um, understand it's going to be diff- difficult for a couple of years. And I always, always, always say that. But if you know that you can sell, right, and don't be afraid of that word, you need to sell, right? Because you need to get out in front of people. If you're a person who's sitting behind a laptop, you're, that's not for you. So you just go and find a firm and just go and work for a proper firm. But if you want to do it yourself, you need to be able to sell. You need to be massively, massively resilient. And you need to just consistently go at it day after day after day. If you were to really consider the fact that you've got little or no control over your future revenues, and it's your future revenues and therefore your profits are predicated by global events of, over which you've got zero control up and down. That doesn't sound like a sound business model. You know, you, your revenue, our revenue, well, anyone who's an assets-based fee model can literally fall 10, 15, 20%, 30% in the course of a year. And that's going to wipe out for most advisors. That's pretty much all their profit. They're now making a loss for a period of time. And I used to saying, well, we'll bank, the, we'll bank the sort of money in the good days and we'll sort of bring it out in the bad days. I don't think it's a sound business proposition. If I was going to um, invest in a business over which they had got zero control of their future cash flows and revenues, I would be questioning that as a business model. Zero is a bit strong there. What, what influence do you have over the, the global capital markets, which are actually which determine your pers- your revenues and your business? Well, we don't have any. I mean, there could be a, bo- a bomb could go off I, somewhere this afternoon, I'm and not, the market, I'm, your income will fall. I'm not saying we have any influence. I'm saying the historical data, you know, go, goes back centuries. So, so we've got some insight of where we're going to move. We just don't know exactly which direction. But yeah, and, as, and I suppose it, my point, point on that would be. Would, would be, well, if we're asking our clients all the time to look to the long term, then we should also be prepared to look to the long term. And I suppose that was our big move towards the, you know, towards the trail model, the lower initial fees and all of that kind of stuff. So therefore, we're going to take the, the rough with the smooth over a long period of time. I'm comfortable that that will smooth itself out. Okay. And also our, also our, our, um, 
our ambitions are aligned. So I'm feeling the pain with the clients. And, you know, when things are going well, then, you know, everybody is, is happy. And, and the, just the final point of that, if we have clients who kind of invest on one of our lower tiers and move through, more than half, you know, we, we will and we have done and we will continue to reduce their fees as we go. So there it just, are benefits. It, se- it, seems, for- it seems odd to me that your the, the, the value that you deliver to the clients uh, and the and the work and the time probably during periods of market stress and tension when market capital market values fall will increase, and yet your revenues will fall. Now, I don't know. I know nothing about your kind of um, your, your your business and your P and L and your sort of forecasts and stuff. But there's plenty of businesses that if they had, which has happened many times in the past, sustained periods. I'm talking five, seven, eight years of low or zero market returns or, or negative per- periods of negative return. You're going to have to, and this has happened before. I'm, 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 I'm aware of various companies that start making redundancies. They start after laying off, laying off staff, which is not ideal. From if you if you're hiring people, if yeah, your income, if your income right, fell, if your business income fell thirty percent and stayed low for two or three years, let's uh, let's you know, hear, someone's going to have to take the hit. Let's hear from the Watford Wise one. Over to you, Chairman. Well, well, Carl, just just if you have some, go on, something pertinent to say, my friend. You normally do. Yeah, I, 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 I think saying that we're going to have five to seven years of zero return, right? That, would that hurt Metas Ireland? 100%. However, if Metas Ireland was 100% fee-based and we had five to seven years of zero return, that would also hurt us because we'd have difficulty, number one, collecting fees, and number two, I'm not sure the business would come in as it had done. So I, I don't think it's to say that one... Um, model is you know going to be totally sheltered from that kind of environment i think that that model any every model would struggle if if that happened we spoke in the last episode about having a few difficult um conversations with clients because we've had no growth for 18 months but like has you know we're we'll we'll man up and we'll, we'll talk about it and final point is um you know do we have loads more work to do when um did we have loads more work to do when Russia invaded Ukraine and markets took a bit of a hiccup? Nope, because we do all of that really hard work and training with our clients along the way in the good times. If your clients are getting older, say, right, do, do and you have a there's natural fall off, like, do you always try and replace those clients or do you let that just organically happen? Or how, how do you deal with... With, it's, with it's it's organically. If you to, it, 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 image-wise, if you imagine a con- and this sounds this sounds cruel, but I'm using this metaphor so you, people can say. But if you imagine a conveyor belt going along, and clients at the end of their lives will drop off the conveyor belt and they fall out of your life as fee-paying people. Okay, I'm not they're human beings, but as fee-paying people, they fall out of your life. And at the other end of the, ca- the, the conveyor belt, you have younger people coming on board. And some years you'll have more people dropping off the end. You'll have more people coming on. I don't have a vigorous client recruitment policy i work by referral only so i do take on the some children of clients some grandchildren of clients i get referrals from an accountant and it kind of washes through carl but it just okay. happens organically it's not me going out and you know i used to do the networking and everything else and i do i, I am taking clients on but i am very choosy and clients are very choosy with me you know the, the, the betting process we are vetting the prospects they, they think they're vetting us we, we are vetting them and a lot of them don't get through don't get through the process so I'm, I, I take clients on, but selectively, but yeah, you, you lose clients. You know, one day I, I might just be that I've got three clients left because the rest of them have died. And I, I shut up shop years ago and I walk away because my business is, I've got my pots stacked up for the rest of my life. Um, you know, that we talked about that as well. That, I, I'm not that's, planning on that's, selling my that's business. That's not Andy's plan. Andy's plan is that you'll give up if, yeah. in a few years and he'll take it all on. But anyway. Yeah, but I've got to find someone I trust and like. And this is where this whole thing always breaks down. <laughs> <isn't it? We've laughs> I was just reflecting, as as you may know, I've been um, I've been sort of away. I've been on holiday for best part of a month, really. And um, I was thinking, and, and I've come back, and I'm back at work today, about half half a stone heavier than I than I left. I've uh, I've enjoyed the good life. And what I was thinking about is, we talk on this podcast quite regularly, and I, I think we can be sometimes unfair w- with our kind of d- demonizing of people. You know, stick to the plan. Buy the great companies of the world, never sell them, stick to the long term, don't worry about volatility, play the long game, etc. And that's just information, but it's hard to do because I can tell you I haven't really stuck to my 
if you like, personal health plan over the last month. What I should be doing is exercising every day, eating healthily, getting eight hours sleep a night. And I can tell you, I haven't been doing that for quite a few weeks. And I was just, I was reflecting on that. that it's easy to say, be consistent in many, many things in life. It's actually quite hard to do. Well, it's certainly hard for me to do. So maybe we should be a bit kinder, more gentle to people, be the advisors, be the clients, be the investors. Um, because it's not, um, yeah, there, there are, there are challenges in doing that. If, if it was as, um, as Derek Sivers, if you followed Derek Sivers, as he said, if <laughs> if all you needed was information, if, if more information helped, then we'd all be billionaires with six packs. 